King Sonica. <laughs> Sonica. You have a sauna four feet from where you sleep. Yeah. Well, I don't, but I, I temporarily get to enjoy the sauna next to the house, which is a godsend for sure. In fact, Very nice. maybe this evening. It's been a couple of days. I think we got some some company right outside these walls. Yeah. The let it pass. Let listeners wait with us. I'm wearing my Invisalign right now, everybody. I saw that. For Joseph and for everyone listening. And the Invisalign is a little bit like the philosophy. At least what I've come to work out in my mind is Vedanta is a lot like Invisalign. Mm Mm-hmm. And this episode is sponsored by. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We wish. Promo code. Yeah. yeah. Invisalign, YF- if you're interested. YFY50 to get 50%. If you need us off. to promote you. But it is a lot like Invisalign. And don't worry, everyone. I won't do the whole episode with Invisalign. In fact, that's kind of why it's like Vedanta, is that it. There's so. There's a temptation to. Uh, get so into the philosophy that you think that's it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yet it's just to guide to give some constraints or or just to offer that these might be principles that end up giving your life constraints but it doesn't and they themselves aren't constraints and but then it's it's meant for you to go beyond it Mm mm-hmm to where you go from every day applying these little trays, these little retainers, and and then slowly but surely, one day you're just, and then there you go. Yeah. It's yeah. straightened and they're gone. Yeah. yeah. It's like health. It's your original nature. Right. Not that you should ever stop exercising, but... Yeah, it it reveals what you already is. It's a culture. It removes the misconceptions. That's about all, ultimately. Mm. It gives you something to get hooked onto that uh, allows all the nonsense to fall off. And what's left is the truth. But the Vedanta, yes, ultimately is itself just uh, no, i shouldn't say just it is a culture it is a culture that removes the free radicals of ignorance floating around causing problems in life it's an interesting choice of words because i i remember hearing someone described it as a critique on culture as well mm-hmm. i think that's part of the the attraction i had for it was that it is a a different lens by which you can look out into the world, look out into, look within yourself that is so different from the cultural colloquial lenses that we're all just so prone to attach to. Yep. And it's one of the things that I actually, I think is similar to, you have some, and by the way, that that metaphor of of straightening the teeth, what's, I did not plan uh this part of the metaphor, but our almost two year old, your goddaughter, Mm -hmm. Marley, Mm -hmm. she had a, she would love to pacify her first year Mm -hmm. and a half of her life. Mm -hmm. And it was so convenient to pacify a crying baby, Mm -hmm. put this little thing in their mouth that they Mm -hmm. distract from, distracts them from the crying. But her teeth were coming in all strange. Yeah. 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 And wayward. Yep. And the doctor said, okay, you've got to wean her off of the pacifier. Yep. Because it's causing this disfiguration of, of mm-hmm. her teeth and mouth. Mm. And her teeth that were so uh, just errant mm. took the pacifier out and they straightened themselves. Yeah, that's good to be young. Right. It's good to be young. And it's, to your point, the, the natural state yeah. was... 
homeostasis is strong in the young. Yes. It's an amazing thing. It, amazing. It's got a natural form that it wants to be in, and mm. it, will, it will adjust and fix itself, which we don't enjoy so much later. <laughs> mm. Right. Yeah. Post 40. It was just, it, and it was a phenomenal experiential front row seat into like, what are my pacifiers? Mm hmm. Yep. That are having these wild disfiguration consequences that I'm not even aware of that just take them away and there will be this realignment back to a natural order. Yeah. That's that's what it is. That's what Vedanta is. I had a friend, uh, Ben Waterman. Shout out to Ben. He might listen to this. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, he's a quiet, consistent student of Vedanta. Quiet in the sense he doesn't... Nobody knows he's out there studying Vedanta every day. And I, but I know he is. So shout out to Ben. He came to visit me in the ashram. Um, gosh, man, it must be... I don't know, 2001, 1998, some long time ago, he came to visit and um, he was there for a month or so studying and one day he mailed me a letter and said, Vedanta's like soap. Vedanta's like soap. It gets you clean, but it doesn't get any dirt in it. <laughs> I was like, okay. It was kind of a cool idea. So from another side, you know, mm -hmm. from the Vedanta side of things, it's a, it's a, it's something we use to clean ourselves. In the early morning, I bathe my intellect in the stupendous and cosmogonal philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, said Thoreau. So that's what it is. You, you get all kind. We all add nonsense to our minds, to our preoccupations. We add attachments every day. You know, you sleep on it for a day, you'll add a, start adding little sticky bits of attachment starting to grow. And we all have it. I mean, it's all there. But there is a, um, there is a cleansing of the intellect, of the capacity, of the mind, for lack of a better word of the personality that happens with a consistent daily study of Vedanta that just lets you relatively, you know, to bring it down to earth a little bit, relatively to just see things how they is really mm. just understand like how things work and kind of remove the exaggeration, the inflammation around life, the drama maybe is a better way to talk about it. Like, yeah, things happen. Good things happen. Bad things happen. Neutral things happen, but nothing is the end. Nothing mm -hmm. is as important as we make it ever. And uh, the study of Vedanta purifies us of all that. Relatively, even just cleansing our basic ability to think and feel and reset every day. Mm. That's why we say do it first. Do it at the beginning. And then um, ultimately, sure, it also just, I always say just, I got to stop doing that. It also ultimately removes the entire delusion of uh, I am this limited being with the birthday and the death day and, you know, this whole thing we're fighting to upkeep all the time and uh, after that Vedanta goes in the fire with the rest of it so he, he says very clearly in the, in the Gita uh, as is the use of a well of water where everywhere water overflows such is the use of the Vedas to the seer of the supreme so the use of the Vedas uh such as the use of the Vedas. There's no use for it after that. But Vedas means Vedanta, this philosophy. Mm. For the seer of the supreme. 
for us, there's plenty of use for it. Oh, I need my Invisalign. <laughs> I need my, my Vedanta line, mm-hmm. you know, every day. Um, but once a person gets to that highest state, then Vedanta goes away. But even now, it, as you rightly say, as you started at the top saying, it's always good to know there's a difference between uh, Vedanta and what it's pointing to. Mm. And I think that's the very recent thought because it is so, uh, it's so contrary to, it's crazy stark contrast to mm-hmm. the worldview we, we grew up in. Mm-hmm. Anyone does, but especially, uh, you know, in, in the West and in the Bible Belt, so different. Mm-hmm. And yet in many ways it is so purely, it was always there. Mm. I mean, it is Christ's words n- have never had more meaning than yeah. with the Vedantic lens. I mean, it was pure Vedanta. Right. right. It's pure Vedic um, wisdom. And and that will sound so strange. It'll feel like uh, anyone hearing that that is lightly aware of both, will it will probably sound like they're poles apart. Mm. And then you go deeper and deeper, and it's like, oh, it's the same source. There are only pulls apart from the, I don't know, the packaging that it, it gets delivered in. Um, but the, and, it, and it's also one of the things that I love about Christianity is that it's also a critique on culture and the way that, you know, Hebrew culture was a culture. Um, Islam is a culture. Hinduism is a culture. Mm-hmm. But Vedanta, Christianity, uh, or Christ's words, it's its like, whoa, be careful mm-hmm. with the culture that mm-hmm. you know, be in the world but not of the world, mm-hmm. a type of uh, critique. Mm-hmm. The um, But this recent thought has been kind of this, this slow motion bomb that's been going off of the point is to go beyond the philosophy, not for many times soon. Mm-hmm. But uh, as you said, it's it is a pointer. Yeah, and don't get fixated on the the moon branch. Right. Keep using every experience each day to really see what the philosophy is is pointing to. Yeah. And and perhaps that's a question for you is, <clears throat> can you see what the philosophy is pointing to mm-hmm. um, when you're still on the early on ramp to the philosophy? Uh, early on ramp, probably not early on ramp. You're probably still just, uh, inspired by the philosophy and the newness of it and the sparkle and the exoticness, which it is. It's all those things. It's a remarkable thing. It's intellectually exotic. It, I mean, um, it depends on a person's background, you know, like in your case, you'd been listening to thousands of hours of Eastern philosophy from various things. So a lot of it was kind of new to you. But yes, if a person is complete, sorry, wasn't new to you. If a person is, you know, absolutely fresh and they've just been like surfing and going to work and like doing their life and never thought about anything about what life is, where did it come from? What's the purpose? What is this thing in the, what is this phenomenon called life in the first place? You know? Which is a remarkable place to be. I mean, in many ways, the beginner's mind is what we should all strive to maintain, you mm-hmm. know, because that is the 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 freshest part of of the journey in a certain way. So f- at first, it could be very exciting, the philosophy itself. You can be very excited about the philosophy itself. Um, very excited about the, what we were saying the other day, the technology of Vedanta, you know, because it is. It's amazing. Um, but then eventually, yes, uh, you begin to recognize that it is all the philosophy itself. And Swamiji says this in his books. He says, Vedanta cannot directly take you to the truth. It, it, is, it can indirectly help that journey. To try to go directly from worldliness, from a worldly normal kind of terrestrial mindset and just drop it all and rip it all away and 
try to think of pure consciousness, forget becoming it. It's just impractical and probably actually very uh, destabilizing if a person tried to do that. You know, it just doesn't just doesn't work that way. Everything has a process. Mm -hmm. Everything in nature has a process. You understand? Like everything that is has consequences. You you take your time to approach it carefully. Uh, most certainly dropping your identity. This is not, this is not for the faint of heart. So Vedanta takes you by the hand from where you are, slowly, surely, starts introducing this thought of the higher, thought of what we mean by the higher. I don't know what people understand. That's a problem. It starts taking you to the thought of the transcendental, to the fact that you may not be only what you think you are. That your identity may be something that is much transcendent, more transcendent than you could possibly understand. So it slowly, slowly starts to um, impress upon you this, this idea. And depending on where a person starts, number one, in terms of their um, understanding, number one. And number two, how much effort can they put in? These two factors will determine how long it takes for them to start to uh, peek over the horizon a bit. And that's not a, that, 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 that totally depends on each person uh, how, much they, how much effort they can put in and where they, can, they can, uh, where they start. But it is true. That faith is like the bird, said Rabindranath Tagore. Faith is like the bird that feels the light and sings while the dawn is still dark. So somehow the birds know the sun's coming up, you know, and uh, it's there. Mm -hmm. So after a while, you, it is, it, it is uh, realistic to expect that you start to get a sense, a whiff of something. Something ephemeral, something, sorry, uh, ethereal. You, Swami says you, you begin to breathe an ethereal air. You start walking around knowing, having a very strong suspicion that, okay, this is all going on, but there's something else really going on. Hmm. And that, that can happen, you know, way before anybody's getting close to moksha. Liberation. There's so, okay, there's so much within what you just said that I want to unpack. And I'm going to try to keep in mind that there's a, a very real chance this might be for a listener your first episode. Mm -hmm. But I also want to keep in mind that it, you, this might be your 30th and you want to go into the deep end mm -hmm. at least just to explore it because nearly every Vedantic text does not leave that deep end uncovered. It mm -hmm. talks about it even if it's only a small portion. Yeah. So in that deep end that we're talking about where it's, and we are really, I, I think you'll, you might have an easier task with this given your extended expertise in the subject, but I'm really going to struggle with language in this episode um, as we talk about beyond the philosophy. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has struck me about this, even asking you, can you see beyond the philosophy even when you're still on the on-ramp? And uh, I still see myself as very much on the on-ramp, not on the highway. You know, I'm not 100 miles into, you know, the highway yet. Yeah. But it's this very strange thing where it's pointing to an experience beyond the philosophy, beyond any of the words. And so there's this right now, you know, today, this afternoon as we record this, there's this pull isn't the right word, but almost like an unveiling of like, wow, there, this is so much deeper mm. than these, as you said, these incredibly exotic words. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh verbal revelations mm -hmm. it's all it's like um and i don't even this isn't even a a uh, hyperbolic statement but 
Vedanta is, um, it's like everyone, everyone being told you're Neo mm -hmm. in the Matrix. Mm -hmm. And not in some apocalyptic way, but in a, in a much simpler way as well. But in a much simpler, um, much more peaceful way that everything you're looking at, everything you have leaned on, everything that you think is real mm -hmm. is not. Is it cannot be leaned on. It cannot be held on to. And furthermore, it was it's not even there and it never was. Right. And I think for first time listener, they're like, dude, this sounds like an crazy mm -hmm. one um this sounds uh crazy mm. but it's in terms of continuous study it's the it's the oldest philosophy known to man like this is not a new concept it's the oldest concept that we have been talking about for as you know humanity has been talking about for mm. five thousand plus years and so it's it's almost like, okay, I want to study the map of whatever the hell this is talking about. Mm. And, and so you start to read the books. You start to really reflect on them daily, study them daily, slowly. I mean, the Gita, just verse by verse. And, in, and I think this is also a testament to uh, what we said in, in previous episodes, the way that Swami teaches, it just starts to happen. You said it the other day so so beautifully, and that you said um, you don't even realize it's happening. Mm -hmm. You don't even realize what's happening in that systematic thought flow right. that you get to just slip right into. Right. As he teaches methodically, you know, daily. Right. And and then these this map starts to you're looking at the map and it starts to become the territory mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you're looking at the territory and you're it's becoming real mm. um and it's the and so it's this weird uh i guess bookends of seeing oh my god it's more than just words which is so silly to say because obviously the whole time mm -hmm. it's it is like you forget that beginner stage where you're you're reading the words for the first time. The title is Beyond Knowledge. Beyond Knowledge, right. Vedanta. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 title. Word, the title of the philosophy is The Truth is Beyond Knowledge. It's beyond this these thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's a it's the what's the Zen phrase? Beginner's mind, yeah. expert's mind. Yeah. Like it in the beginning you know it's pointing something beyond the words. But yeah. two years in, three years in, five years in, you can get Fascinated. fascinated by the words yeah the words not only the words the, but i don't mean the, it's not just linguistic the ideas themselves mm -hmm. the ideas themselves are so uh enchanting they're so interesting they're so unique they're so they're stuff you never thought about before then you think like that's that's it mm. that's the idea you know and this is this goes back to the upanishads the Upanishadic days, the master would say something probably ridiculously brilliant, you know, and, and the student would say, wow, and he'd go off and reflect upon it for a year and come back and, and um, tell the master his very inspired, probably, conclusion about what the truth is, and I've got it, and it's wonderful, and all they ever said is neti neti, mm. means not that, not that. Not that, not that. And it's mm. an easy thing to do because anything anybody says is nati nati. Any idea, no matter how great or how grand or how well articulated or well put together, is not that. That is not an idea. <laughs> is that the last penny to drop? Oh, I mean, it's neti definitely neti. out there. It's definitely one of the later ones. But, I mean, at some point when you become super conversant with the philosophy, you understand it's it, the, the thing that you're actually pursuing is not the philosophy. It's like after you really master how to paddle, 
you really master how to read waves. You really master to where, where, which was the best direction of the wind and this spot's tide and that tide and this season and that season and this swell angle and that swell angle. Popping up and getting on the right, perfectly aligned on your board with the wave. It's a super journey, which fins to put in, which, which, so which type of rails to have on your custom board. Once you go to the full nth degree of mastering all of the the tools of surfing and the understanding of surfing and the history of surfing and the mythology of the greatest surfers and you know the whole you're just like in it it comes down to what one thing that experience whatever that is mm. and all surfers come to that point where they're like it's it hasn't it's not about that it's not about the board or the size of the wave or then anything it's they they joke they say the best surfer is the one who's having the most fun and fun may not be the best word for it because it's much deeper than that i don't i wouldn't belittle surfing and say it's just anything it's not just fun it's there's something deeply profoundly experiential which every surfer will tell you only a surfer knows the feeling it's deeper it is a connection there's something that happens when energy that started in new zealand is pushing you on your board in malibu it's it's just unreal and there's a there's a, a moment that can happen on a surfboard that's what people are after not all of that preparation and all of those documentaries they've watched and all the histories and stories of all the great surfers and all the techniques and all the different ways and what different outfits people wear and mm -hmm. haircuts it's like there's a lot of similarities in this metaphor right and that's just surfing that's just a physical uh, see i shouldn't say really i've got to stop saying just so well, there's the, something the, powerful in the way you're saying just because it is it is so simple yeah but and my point is that that is a worldly experience you know some mm -hmm. will say no it's a spiritual experience but in this it's worldly in the sense that it's it's something done in a, in a activity in the in the terrestrial plane what Vedanta is talking about is is beyond experience itself. It's the very isness. It's the very underlying fact that you is. It is what is left of you when everything that you think you are is removed. Hmm. Remove everything that you think of yourself. That's the self, right? That's and that is a a key difference from the matrix. You don't get to the other side as a super neo right get to the other side and you're like that whole thing including that neo character yeah. none of it was right reality which is the very different which is the you're right is to say that that's the problem with that whole series is that mm -hmm. well no there's there's still the real world mm. no vedanta just takes it all away all of it and um this can this is something that you can't directly deal with so vedanta comes to you wherever you are and meets you there and says come on this is the way so even if you're a materialistic money seeking person it puts a goddess there lakshmi and you start with her you know and if you're a knowledge seeking academic from bengal you know um they put Saraswati there, the goddess of learning. You know, they start wherever you are and say, okay, you want success, you want productivity, you want whatever it is. Or yeah, you're a Silicon Valley founder, entrepreneur, yeah. me, six years ago, and it was attach, you lose, detach, you gain. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, wow, well, I've tried the first part. Yeah. And that was right. Yeah. Attached, yeah. obsessed, white knuckled, held on so hard mm. seven days a week mm -hmm. and lost mm. i think there's something to the second the latter guidance yeah and it when it was very materialistic it still is I mean, it's, yeah. it, it will be until it's not but it was wow that's a better way of living yeah but there was we recorded an episode last year where we talked about the divine disorientation mm -hmm. and i'm sh I, I would love to know what you you think of is is there a constant 
I imagine there is a constant disorientation, reorientation, disorientation, reorientation. But in this current undulation of the wave, it's like there was a, I heard someone say a great story is orientation gives you a, you know, it's the world. It's 1953, New Orleans, it orients you to the world. Then there is you, character development. You fall in love with these two characters that you are married. And then there's disorientation. It's the second act, some tragedy, some conflict. Then the third act is reorientation. Mm -hmm. Then there is this, um, Hegel uh, used to talk about in the dialectic of, um, these weren't his words, but it's commonly talked about as like, uh, si synthesis or thesis, antithesis, they fight. And then synthesis, something better is, mm -hmm. is born on the other side. Mm -hmm. And similarly in a good story, orientation, disorientation, then something better reorientation. Yeah. And there seems to be some reorientation. There was a long while there where I was, it was like turning, a, I think the metaphor I would use with you is like turning a huge, huge sh ship around yeah. that was going so fast in one direction, just yeah, yeah. really lost feeling like mm. no progress was made, but I needed mm. to trust that mm. stillness was mm. progress. Now, like there's some, something that's, happening where it's going beyond the words mm -hmm. and i'm going super vulnerable in this because i have not thought about this topic. i haven't voiced this topic out loud with yeah. you yeah um so for lack of words but i am at a lack of of probably the right words but it is seems like there's this reorientation that's happening sure is that common to where a few years into this in your words, exotic knowledge and wisdom, yeah, reorients you, and and then you're, I don't know, on the right on ramp, yeah. or is it a constant disorientation that I should expect a year from now, and then six months from now at some point, and then a reorientation, then disorientation, reorientation. Um, it's kind of like um, uh, does that question make sense? Yep. It does make sense. It it can be disorienting and uh, probably should be if properly done, but managed. You know, it should. It's a delicate balance. It shouldn't be too disorienting. Um, but if you're not putting in effort enough, then it doesn't really shake you up enough. Mm. So I would say, um, you know, in the context. Uh, where I've seen the most people go through the process is the ashram. And Swami talks often, he says it's very common for a person to really take off like a plane getting up to flight level, you know, getting up to 35,000 feet. They take off at LAX and within, you know, 25 minutes, they're at six miles above the Pacific Ocean heading to Tokyo. There's a lot of... Uh, drastic, uh, clear sense of elevation going on at first. And also effort and maybe turbulence and struggle and uncertainty, and uh, but growth. So it, it, the thing about the reason I bring up the ashram is that it's easier to understand in kind of a such a concentrated situation as that. Mm -hmm. A person comes with tons of desires, normal, like all of us who arrive there. You show up with... Uh, desires, attachments, worries, and anxieties, drama, stories, family stuff, friend stuff, job stuff, maybe, maybe not, school stuff, whatever level you came out of, life, whatever age. And you get there, and for a while it may be like rocky, you're missing stuff or whatever, but quite quickly, a lot of stuff falls off, right? A lot of things fall off, including your concepts and and confusions and, and and what will people think and the turbulence of like because yeah. you you did it you, you got on it. that plane yeah yeah you're done and th i mean that's an extreme version of this probably a small only a small percentage of listeners would even think of going to the ashram um and maybe if we're lucky if a handful end up going there from the history of yfyi that'd be awesome you know got one person going in january 
Um, coming to visit, yeah. Coming to visit, yeah, just yeah, to visit. Yeah, yeah. Um, but a listener has already turned into <laughs> yeah. a visitor to the ashram. So, no, I mean, you never know. Maybe someone out there will hear this and, and want to do the three-year course at Vedanta Academy. But what happens is uh, you quickly burn through a lot of the superficial stuff that's weighing you down, both just emotionally, your attachments and all these things, but also even intellectually which I think is more what you're talking about, a subtler sort of thing where you're like, okay, I'm grappling with this thing and, and uh, I, I'm getting to a point where it's, I'm more easily able to identify with something that's the words are pointing at that's not a specific concept, but just kind of an awareness of awareness that's just happening. Um, seems like as if from somewhere else, you know? So, uh, it does seem like that, it, 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 but it's not from somewhere else. It's, it's just your own clarity being revealed, being unfolded. But it seems as if maybe, my gosh, everything is more clear. There's some, something coming on to me. It's not like that. It's, just, it's actually just your own shutters opening a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Then it's very common to hit a plateau, like flight level 3-5. Just thirty five thousand feet, you know. It's 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 like that, you know. Um, you cruise and you may cruise for a long time, a really long time. And then I remember Swami saying, "It's like a frog. Like after that, it could be like a leap, and then you sit there for a while, and then another leap. It's kind of like surfing, it, talent, you know, skill wise. Yeah, like it. Yep, yep. One day you just." confidently step over the edge of a double overhead wave and you're you're a different surfer and it took you a hundred sessions to do that and you did it confidently and you buried your rail and you went down the line in a way that you never thought of before you experience a bottom turn that it feels like cutting through glass you feel like you're flying it's on it's the most amazing thing and after that you're like okay that's mm -hmm. how you turn a surfboard <laughs> you know I mean? mm -hmm. but but yeah and then you stay there for a while so so um the thing is, it, it's um, uh, if done systematically, if done especially with guidance, if done in a tradition, in a in a traditional way, um, the the gains that you make are permanent. You know, it's like culture. Swami says, it's like you can't. Yeah. You know, you may stab a, your food with a knife sitting around a campfire and eat it off your knife just for fun. But a cultured person will never do that when you're at the palace with the king. You know, mm -hmm. you're not going to stab the... F I mean, culture, mm -hmm. you don't un deculture like that unless something just really traumatic happens to your brain or something. You're, you're going to be basically cultured, you know. Kind you, of like yeah, where you're 15 and someone asks you who you are you're always going to say your name you're always going to oh, this is who yeah. you've been cultured to yes know that identity and right i right. guess you you're saying you can be cultured without knowing everything cultured to know certain things yeah through the same method of reiteration right so the growth true growth as a human being true objectivity self-sufficiency universal love, deep cheerfulness that may expresses sobriety, maybe, but whatever. I mean, being you may be less expressive, but all of these deep traits of self-development that he talks about, at the end of Vedanta Treatise, he talks about these characteristics of self-development, you know? We're all somewhere zero to 100% on these, the range of these qualities. Once you reach certain flight levels, you're not descending. That way, that's the end of the metaphor. The metaphor doesn't work. You're not landing again. You're not coming back to LAX. You're, you, you reach a certain height. And you, not that you don't go through some issues and you have some doubts and things along the way. But, <clears throat> but again, to move higher, to shake up that plat the plateau you're on, to get, to continue moving uh, you have to continue to put in effort. That's the thing. You have to continue to challenge yourself. You have to continue to work against, let's say, in spite of your egoistic 
impulses, um, your preferential likes and dislikes. If things don't feel like you would like to do them, but you know you should, grab them at every stage of the way, at every stage. Because those are the things that will that grow you. Because obviously you're hitting an edge. Obviously you're hitting some fiber of ego that's not liking it. And you break through it, then you break through enough of them, and all of a sudden you'll have one of those aha moments, one of those leaps. And these are it's it, it is in the intellect. I mean, where else could it be? The self doesn't evolve. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? The, the consciousness is there. It it doesn't evolve. The intellect unfolds. The 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 buddhi gets a deeper and deeper appreciation of the greater and greater depths um, that are there. That's why uh, that prayer that we say twice a day at the ashram. The Gayatri Mantra, uh, very famous. Burbu Vasoha Tat Savitur Varenyam Bargo Devasya Dimahi Dio Yo Na Prachodayat. The last phrase, Di in Sanskrit, means Buddhi, intellect. Di. Dio Yo Na Prachodayat. May our intellects unfold. May we unfold our intellects in the Tat Savitur Varenyam, the divine effulgence of, of the sun. Meaning uh, the knowledge. May the knowledge of the self unfold our intellects further. This is chanted twice a day in the ashram. Morning after yoga and evening before the evening class. And You know, you can take like a superficial understanding of that, that mantra, that prayer. You can take it to be... It's literally you stand and you face the sun. Bur Bhuvaswaha, Tat Savitur Varenyam. Bur Bhuvaswaha, I mean the three worlds. The, that divine sun that is in living in the three worlds. Bargo Devasya Dimahi Dio Yona Prachodat. You can take it as just thank you for uh, coming. <laughs> thank you for growing the crops. But it's, <clears throat> which is also true, good to pay your respect to the sun, no doubt. But <clears throat> it's, it, the sun symbolizes a deeper. Uh, thing, which is that knowledge of self. Let that knowledge of self, let that, let the higher, let the self, as it were, unfold our intellects. So that unfolding, every time you unfold a little bit more, the earlier petals uh, start to seem dry and kind of, I don't know, colorless. Things that when they first came out of the bud that first opened of yourself, you're like, oh my God, that's amazing. That's oh. what you thought it was all about. You thought it was all about that. Brave. It's like just the outer layer of the the fruit that's the, the petal. Tell. Yeah. The lotus opening, you know. So the this is a very common metaphor. Again, the lotus <clears throat> throughout the Eastern traditions. It's right. the unfolding thing. So as that happens, you become... More and more and more uh, interested in the self itself. Less and less interested in the pointers. Um, so yeah, the thinking about thinking about the self is very different from thinking about the self. Mm. So a lot of philosophy is thinking about how you can think about the self. Right. And it's fascinating. And it's like, wow, that's amazing. You think about a person who thinks about the self. Think You're thinking about a person thinking about the self. That's different from thinking about the self. And that thinking directly about the self, which is not possible, Vedanta, but at least putting your thoughts in that direction can be very... Um, Uh, can be disorienting perhaps, can be, could be boring at times. You know what I mean? It, 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 it may not have that newness all the time. That's why he says, uh, in the, I think in the preface to Vedanta Treatise, if not in chapter one, he says, do your study, relate to Vedanta like a university student relates to their studies. 
Sometimes certain lectures, university students are excited to go. That guy, he's talking about this today. But a lot of the time, it's like, okay, going to class. Got to go to class. Mm -hmm. So that, but there's a deeper conviction that ultimately this, this degree is going to help me or whatever it is, you know? So there's this deeper understanding in the correct way of approaching Vedanta that, uh, uh, yeah, I may not like it all the time. I may not find it uh, exciting all the time, but it is it is subtly knocking away um, misconceptions that we're not even aware it's doing. Number one, liberating you from them, and it is also introducing a new uh, approach. To everything, to to yourself mainly, not even about the world, to what I am. And uh, yeah, it can have. There can definitely be leaps, all of a sudden, and and uh, even that's covered very very much in the scriptures. You know, people's having these eureka moments and thinking they're there. You know, oh my God, I've seen the truth. You know. <laughs> The masters are not excited by that. Mm. <laughs> They're just not. Their non-excitement is the best teaching. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're just like, okay. Because yep. <laughs> you expect to like have a party with them and it's instead it's like running into a wall. Right. You, like, you, yeah. Yeah, there is... Um, <clears throat> to what Swami... Will say if you've got to make the objective subjective and then the irony is as it becomes more subjective it becomes more objective like as it becomes more personalized to you it becomes more realized as objective it's the the experience i one experience i had um an hour earlier today before a conversation that really just kind of was like whoa that's strange well, in this the one, this always this goes back to neti neti of like, it, it's this experience of like that's not it, and it's almost like the more that it's experienced, that's not it. These things I thought were it, mm. that I'm, it's just so non plus. So that's not it. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I'm like, whoa, these pedals are falling off, mm. and it was just looking at a light switch, <laughs> mm. just was putting on a shirt and I just looked at a light switch and there was no mm. linguistic processing of like that is a light switch but it was just uh and this is not I'm sure on some level it's ego inflation but it's not meant to be some uh grandiose statement of anything that has been achieved through daily study but it it was just this it was strange and that it was not strange I was just looking at a light switch Mm -hmm. and I would lead people astray by even trying to articulate what happened in an inarticulate experience mm -hmm. it was just five feet away yep. looking at a light switch and uh, almost like um, lucid dreaming where it's like oh this is a dream yep. but without saying that out loud just looking at this thing i've switched a hundred times just happened to look at it and it was just like um that culture is happening sure there's in psychology there's this field of dual processing or this uh theory of dual processing that mm. we're just scratching the surface on mm. but it's this idea you'll laugh when you hear it it's this idea that there's uh, instead of one linear system of thinking that we've conventionally thought of like you're having trouble with x because of this linear projection or transference of instead of lin one linear uh, system of processing, there's two systems happening at mm. each time. And it can conventionally be talked about as thinking fast and thinking slow, mm. but it doesn't quite hit it. But the, the gist of it is you have this reaction. It's almost like your reptilian brain wants to react in some way. And then you have a slower prefrontal cortex driven system of thinking called system two system one and system two is slower mm -hmm. but actually has a better response mm -hmm. 
And what's so funny about it is it's just so hand in glove, mind and intellect mm -hmm. of just what Vedanta has been saying for thousands of years of, of there are two internal equipments. There isn't just one like we conventionally think of the brain and the, right. now the brain is having this linear thought. Yeah, You're constantly having these these this dialogue between these two systems. Yep. And what's interesting about uh, the dual processing is that the psychologists that study it say that you can move your system one, the fat thinking fast mm -hmm. um, thought flow, uh, thought patterns into system two over time. Uh -huh. So you can get them to actually perform less reactionary mm -hmm. behavior. Sure. And much more <laughs> guided behavior yeah. from thinking slower. Yeah. Um, and turn your thinking fast system, this is their language, into much more regulated, mm. guided behavior, which is so perfectly yeah. uh, aligned to um, Vedanta of your intellect becomes the, is, is it accurate to say your intellect be, over time just becomes the primary thought flow? Yeah, sure. You could take it that way. It's the, it governs every subtle movement in, in your personality. It governs your thinking. It governs what feelings you allow. It governs all that. And therefore, your actions are absolutely controlled. Actions follow thoughts and desires. And the body won't do anything by itself. So yeah, that, that's what happens. The intellect in an ideal personality is thought-to-thought -thought governing. So to the extent that we're able to... Um, develop the intellect to that extent the um the mind is led so you have feelings you have emotions but they never get the better of you you don't you, you're never victimized by impulsiveness or uh, anything preferential within yourself you are it's it's really impossible to um perturb you in any way um, you have complete control over your personality. <laughs> like Swami, I remember, he tells this story in the e-learning course. You might have heard it in the e-learning course. Probably, yeah. There was, this, there was this girl from South Africa who was... <clears throat> uh, anyway, she was like that. She, she, <laughs> she was like, yeah, well, okay, Swami, but if I tickle you, you're going to... Like he was talking about being controlled. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You heard this story mm -hmm, in e-learning? Mm -hmm, yeah. So she, just for the listeners, yeah, she was like, if I tickle you, you know, you're going to be, uh, you'll be laughing and wanting to get away from me. And he's like, come tickle me. And this is like in class on the dais in front of like 75 <laughs> people. And he's like, come up here and tickle me. You know? On camera. Uh, yeah, I don't think, I hope those tapes are, anyway, those, those VHS tapes back in those days, I think, mm -hmm. um, in her time. Maybe on it may be recorded, hopefully. Um, but yeah, he just like raised his arms and he's like, "Tickle me." <laughs> <laughs> I can't and, even control myself just hearing about it, dude. This. And she starts tickling him like properly, like getting after him, You're tickling him, you know. <laughs> and he's just looking at her, and just deadpan, just completely flat faced, just staring at her, uh. just looking at her, you know. <laughs> and um, she was quite frustrated by that, you know. And, you know, um, you can't insult a person like that. You're not going to, I don't care. You put them in prison, it doesn't bother them. You know, you, you execute them on a cross and have his friends, who his disciples and his students denounce him and say they never knew him. Sell and, him away for 30 pieces of silver. And right? he's like, he's cool. All he's thinking about is them. He's mm. praying for them. He's like, God, don't do it. Father, let forgive them. Yeah, you're not gonna. How are you gonna bother somebody like that? You put them in prison. They're like, cool, man. I've got time to contemplate. You know. So um, that is. Those are all absolute examples. Ramana Maharshi having his surgery done on the back of his shoulder, cutting out this giant tumor out of his back with no uh, anesthetic. While he's reading the paper. He's like sitting there reading the paper with one hand while they cut out his mm. his back. I mean, come on. They just, they're, they're, these are, I don't mean to make all the examples physical. Emotionally insult them. 
take away somebody in a tragic accident who they were apparently attached to. It, whatever. It, it, say that their their knowledge is illogical. I, I don't know. At whatever level you can insult a person. They these these people you can't touch them. They're not uh, available to be disturbed because their intellect is so profoundly rooted in what is. That's what's real. Everything else is your light switch. It's just whatever. It's something that's in the field of awareness for now. That's about it. But the field of awareness is there no matter what happens. And we don't know what that is. So it seems like nothing. But as our good friend Peter said in his one of his Below the Line episodes, that nothing is something. Mm. No truer statement was ever made. That nothing is something. That, that thing that seems like when everything else is removed from our field of awareness, we think, well, what's, what, 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 what about me? What, that is you. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's just they're 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 not laughing at us, but they see us as children. Well, what what about me? When there's only the field of awareness, like what about me? You are the field of awareness. <laughs> you know, um, that takes time. That you got to court that idea. You got to date that idea. You've got to go on long walks with that idea. Go to nice dinners with that idea <laughs> before mm-hmm. you identify with that idea. And, you know, it depends. What's your capacity? Where do you start? How much effort can you put? But the sooner you get to it, the, f- the sooner you're free of the changing world and your changing personality and all the troubles that come with it. Mm. So much be sad about what cannot be what is ineffable it's within the Gita there's you know four characters and conventionally it's it seems just Krishna and Arjuna but it's my experience with it as a complete outsider experience coming across it six years ago and then starting to dive into it the last several years it's like you go from the blind king dritarastra that's just being told a story Mm -hmm. and you're like wow this is interesting you know character development or dynamics happening between these characters in this story and then you're sanjaya and you're like you kind of know the story well well enough to tell people Mm. here's what's you know happening Mm logistically Mm. then after a few years then you move to become arjuna you're like holy shit Mm. this is me every day Mm. Mm. this is this is where i am Mm -hmm. and and obviously the the ultimate goal is is to to not be Arjuna, to realize there is no Arjuna. Um, that's the whole tragedy of the of the seven hundred verse poem. Mm. But uh, but it's been an interesting continuum to to then identify even with the Arjuna character many years in the making, and it just God, builds four or five dimensions mm. from a very two-dimensional text to read the first time. Indeed. So one, one point to make is uh, as people progress this through this uh, journey, the key is to reinvest these gains. Mm. Don't never get a too, too, um, too stoked about mm. the most recent wave the most recent ride or whatever. Respect the ocean. Yeah. Just keep on. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, some penny dropped, some frog hopped up another level on a little bit higher rock. Don't stop till you're done. 
that's that's a key thing because this happens a lot people get like a break in their own mind that's all it's like a break in the clouds you know they they some stupid attachment falls off and they're pretty convinced that they're just about the buddha you know like some something that's been bothering someone even unconsciously for years goes away all of a sudden they feel lighter and they're like oh my gosh i'm there i'm keep reinvesting in that that's part of that system two thing that's part of that uh that intellect being in control is yeah that that feeling i've probably had that feeling 150 times mm -hmm. and that pattern of thought yeah i can i think there's there is some example i can't remember of this great sage that still um succumb to temptation yeah it's basically there still succumb to like complete devolution yeah uh, Vishwamitta. yes mm. yeah mm. so that's certainly but he didn't really he just did it as a yeah he, he quote unquote fell to demonstrate to every he gave up his entire legacy of god knows how many lifetimes of spiritual effort he fell completely into you know materialism as it were just as an example that don't stop till you're done mm. yeah 96 percent of a rocket is of the the weight of a rocket is used to get four percent's really high actually the four percent's like they believe the boundary of how much it, as of now they can is the most weight of a rocket they can get into orbit 96 percent is used to get it there mm. From the, at the takeoff weight it, but they, the most like the they've ever done is three or something so you take 97 percent of the the volume and mass of a rocket to get three percent up wow and elon will tell you that what jeff and those guys are doing as if we know them <laughs> what jeff is doing is easy you shoot up his thing his big thing up into the sky and then the people float down that's not a big deal Getting people to orbit is that's the big deal. That's why only Elon's doing that. He, Jeff can't do that. Yeah, I mean he he's working on it, but only Elon's getting people into orbit. So getting people completely free of gravity is a way different exercise than just getting somebody really high and floating down in parachutes or gliding down in your space plane, Branson. You know. Feel like that should be a tagline for the uh, the crazy cultural rage around psychedelics. Uh, for sure, <laughs> getting how did you put it to get uh, <laughs> getting people into orbit is hard. Getting it's not getting people really high is easy comparatively, and then floating down. Mm. Yeah, true. It, there, there's a, a corollary there for sure. To get to get permanently grown even just permanently to these higher level lo flight levels of culture that we're talking about we should call the episode flight levels of culture just <laughs> just for me jake um so uh to get to those higher flight levels of culture um is itself really hard compared to just like having a moment in costa rica at a retreat where you got a glimpse or you thought you got a glimpse right actually getting established in a higher level is no joke if any of us get up a few levels in one lifetime of effort good on us man it's not easy to get completely into orbit meaning you're permanently free of gravity so it is how many elons are there you know what i mean it's not easy and getting temporarily high and coming down it's it's very easy in comparison yeah much much simpler as always these weekly chats are so illuminating thank you joseph great stuff until next time all right james Woo! that episode was fantastic and if you are digging yoga for your intellect and want to introduce this philosophy to your co-workers and your team well, Joseph and I are down to come visit basically an in-person YFYI. Come visit with you and your team. 
in the same way that you might invite a yoga instructor for a team building event, we're willing to come to your office and talk to your team as well. We can do it over Zoom as well. It is, uh, it's whatever makes sense, but uh, we're even down to do it in person. And that is just in line with the mission of making this philosophy available and accessible to all those that seek it. Joseph and I would love to come talk with you and your team about Yoga for Your Intellect. And that really comes from my perspective of running businesses for the last 15 years and just knowing, man, it was about 10 years ago I was running a 50-person company, led to a trip to the ER, I was drinking seven cups of coffee a day to try to stay on top of everything, um, trip to the ER with a heart condition, Needless to say, it was a very, very stressful, extremely stressful time in life. And that business ultimately failed. And 10 years later, I sit here and, and get to have these conversations with, with Joseph while running two companies and, and a venture fund. Each day just feels like it's a hot knife through butter. I have not had a single day of stress in the last six, seven years of building multiple companies and, and multiple venture funds. It's truly remarkable, and I know that it's not me or the businesses that are different than 10 years ago, but it's my approach to each day and quite literally to the start to the day because every day starts with this philosophy for me, and we want to share it with your team. For me, it feels like an obligation of sorts and a loud siren saying that teams and companies around the globe need to hear this. So if you're interested, email us at, this is the key thing, email us at yoga for your intellect at gmail.com. That's yoga for your intellect at gmail.com. Use the email address in the show notes, and we would love to come chat with you and your team.